What's up, everybody? A uh, little housekeeping first. Uh, number one, um, I'm going to be at the comic strip February 23, 24, 25. The comic strip in Edmonton, Alberta. That's Canada. That's right. Comic strip. Then I go to Zanies in uh, Nashville, March 2, 3, and 4. Then I got Sony Hall in New York City. One show, one show only. Sony Hall um, in New York. Get your tickets at BrianCallen.com. I'm coming back to New York. I'll be a Nyack at the Levity Live West Nyack, New York. So check that out, March 17, 18, 19. No, I'm sorry. It's March 16, 17, 18. Sorry. Um, and then uh, those, there's some more stuff. Just go to BrianCallen.com. Check it out. And, uh, and that's the way that goes. Brian Callen. This is his intro song. Brian Callen. It's one hell of an intro song. His comedy is marvelous. He's a genius in world politics. Let's get into this. Uh, my guest, Leslie Kane is a veteran investigative reporter. She spent decades deep diving into reports of unidentified flying objects, UFOs. She's co-authored studies published by the New York Times, uh, especially the one in December 2017 that was front page news. I remember reading about this, and it was the first time really I had seen any sort of mainstream acceptance that there were unidentified flying objects that had been, had been observed by the military, especially and that we didn't understand how they moved, why they moved the way they did, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, here's my question to start off. And I know you've written also extensively about near-death experiences, which is something we could maybe touch on, but I want to focus on UFOs. And I'll start with this question. It's a loaded question, but it's fun. Okay. If, if you really had to answer, uh, the question is, Leslie, are these unidentified flying objects that you've investigated, or at least the reports thereof, are they extraterrestrials or are they from the U.S. military? That's the big question, right? Yeah. <laughs> so um, I believe, well, extraterrestrial is too, actually too simple a word. I mean, they, as far as I'm concerned, there are at least some UFOs that are not made by human beings. And I'm, really? you know, I believe that to be true. And I'm willing to state that at this point, Brian, because government officials have said things like this. I know a lot of insiders who believe this, and they know a lot more than I do because they have access to classified information. So, I mean, one of the simplest ways to think about that, you know, that, that makes it easier to understand and accept that is to, to realize that back in the 50s, right, 50s, 60s, 40s even, we were seeing the same kind of technology in the sky that we're seeing now. Do you really, can you really imagine that in that, you know, in 1950, that anybody on this planet could, you know, demonstrate the kind of things we're seeing now with these UFOs? I mean, nothing's changed about them. It's the same reports decade after decade after decade. So I think the fact that they go so far back is really compelling. And also, uh, there's uh, so but, but, many of them, they can't all be, hum you know, US technology. But, but what were the what were what are the through lines? Because I think what is what seems to be new now, at least I don't follow it that closely. But, but is that these we have documented evidence, it looks like like some of these objects are moving at speeds uh, that make no sense, at least uh, according to the technology we have now. Now, that doesn't mean DARPA isn't working on some secret stuff. It's very possible that the United States military and other militaries have some pretty crazy technological advances that they're not sharing with anybody. That's what I go to. Right. Um, so I don't That's know smart. that we have, I don't think we have, do we have people in the 50s, 60s, and 70s that are credible talking about this kind of movement with these kind Absolutely. of uh, these objects? We do. Yeah, absolutely. And we actually have government documents that have been released. In the 1970s, there was a huge dump of government documents through the Freedom of Information Act about UFOs. And a lot of them referenced this and they showed, you know, very, very high level officials describing these kinds of behaviors. And there were there were many then that thought they were inter, what they called interplanetary. I mean, they didn't think the way we do now. So, I mean, certainly it was the same 
kinds of technology. And I think, you know, but I just want to address your point. It's absolutely true that many of the things people see could be technology that's being developed by DARPA or some other agency. You know, secret technology is being developed all the time. It's extremely sophisticated, but I just don't think it explains every single event that we've witnessed. And I'm, you know, we're talking about a small number. I mean, most sightings that people have can be explained. That's absolutely true, but there's so enough tell us, of them that can't. Yeah, tell us yeah. about the ones that, tell us the ones that you can't explain it. Tell us about the ones that you believe could be interplanetary of some kind. What what are yeah, the ones that you kind of that kind of blew your mind that you and you've talked to people that just can't explain this? Oh, there's so many of them. But again, I want to qualify it that I wouldn't use the word interplanetary. That was just back in the 50s. That was the going. Oh, okay. And then it became extraterrestrial hypothesis, you know, which is which was sort of the going as the going terminology when I got involved in this in 1999. And that was from very high levels. And now it's, you know, unidentified anomalous phenomena, right? That's the latest uh, acronym that's used, which is just something way broader than what we've thought before as being simply extraterrestrial. So it could be interdimensional or time travelers, and we don't know what it is, and it has all these, you know, very strange paranormal effects, all this kind of stuff. It's much, it's a much broader arena of strangeness than we used to think of it. And I just want to tell you that yeah. that's why this terminology has changed. Um, but in terms of, I mean, oh my God, I, you know, one of the cases that there's so many cases. I mean, I like to go back to the older cases because I think then the technology is harder to explain. There was a case over Iran in 1976, I believe it was, where, um, and this was witnessed by so many military people, there was a gigantic kind of diamond-shaped flashing object just kind of hovering way up in the sky over Tehran. And a couple of jets were sent to scramble it. And this this gigantic flashing thing sent these projectiles out towards the jet. And the jet the the the, the uh, pilot driving this jet who then became a general i mean these were high level very qualified air force people he tried to fire his missiles at this object that was coming for him towards him and every time when he was just about to press the button to fire his all his equipment went out so he would be just about to press he'd be locked into this object and the equipment would go out and then the object veered off it never hit him and he tried it two or three times and every time it was almost as if this thing knew that he was about to fire. I mean, he didn't know how else to explain it. And, you know, this is a there's a chapter in the book I wrote in 2010 written actually by an Iranian general who was the person in that aircraft who tried to shoot this thing down. I mean, that's, you know, it's it, there's no explanation that's ever been offered by any government. Well, or, or, or he has an active of imagination, though. Right. So my worry is that sometimes when people describe these things, I rely less on that. It's more it what I again to your article and to sort of what's what's new about UFO talk, at least, is that the U.S. government, for the first time, is acknowledging that there have been these sightings by enough people so that it's like, and, and, and it's movement we can't explain. And there's even video, right? Is there a video yeah. or anything you've seen that kind of like where people are actually saying this isn't a camera tricks this isn't uh, some weird glitch. This is actually a moving object. I mean, there are the three Navy videos that were released, you know, two of them in 2017 and another one in 2019. But of course, I think that the important point is that the government officials who are saying this, Brian, they have access to all this classified data. So it's not just about sightings. It's about events that are captured on multiple sensory, you know, equipment, multiple, I don't know what exact terminology is, but different sensory gear that all picking up the same thing, including radar and other other methods that they have of gathering data, combined with eyewitness accounts, combined with videos, photographs, you know, combined with ground radar, air, I mean, there's so much data that's available. And a, most of that is not being provided to the public. And that these, for government officials to go out on a limb the way they have and make the statements they have made about the reality of this and the need to investigate it, that's happening because of what they know, what they've been briefed on at a classified level. So the answer, and I know I've been told by people within the program, within the DOD, that yes, we have videos way more uh, compelling than the ones that have been released. Close really? Close up videos. Oh, yes. I mean, this has been confirmed by people who work there in the, within the department. And they had the clearances to see it, but they're not, they can't say anything else because 
they have security oaths that prevent them from saying very much. They can just talk in general terms like that. Wouldn't that be because this is military in nature? I mean, you know, because if, if it was something that no one in the recesses of our intelligence community or our DOD had ever understood or knew about, uh, then you kind of go, I don't know. And then you, you probably say, well, maybe that other department knows, but they're not talking to me. And so, so is it possible that we've made some breakthroughs in material sciences and in technology that, um, you know, that, 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 and what we're really talking about is a drone campaign that's so advanced and we don't want anyone to know about it. Is it, I mean, that, I mean, that, that, we, would you say, yeah. I mean, is, is that what you think is going on? Because why would they keep actual UFOs a secret from us? Well, that's a really big and complicated question. I mean, um, I don't believe, you know, you may be right. I mean, when you study this and you see how many events there are and you've talked to so many people who have been involved, both, uh, you know, people with clearances and pilots and so on, it's very hard to believe that every single one of these events is explainable as being man-made technology. It's just, and it's hard to convey that. It's like I've studied it for so long and I've talked to people on, you know, what you might call insiders who are absolutely positive that that's not the case. And these are people I trust. So, you know, I'm willing to take their word for it because they know a lot more than I do. So, um, but I, 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 I forget what your exact question was, though. Well, no, um, I was just saying, uh, you know, I wonder at times, it's, it's possible that these, this is military technology, so it would make sense right, that the government right. would try to keep that quiet. What doesn't make true. sense... Yeah, yeah, I mean, but, I, I think it's a really valid point, Brian. And, I, you know, it's conceivable that every single UFO event is explainable that way. I don't think that's that's very realistic, especially when you go back in time when we didn't have nobody on Earth had the capabilities that we were able to observe in the 50s and 60s. So, you know, I mean, it's but a lot of them can be that explained explained that way, I'm sure, you know, and, and the point is, I don't have access to classified information. So I'm not in a position to know if some of them can be, but I think it's a, a perfectly reasonable deduction to make. I just don't think well, it takes I, care of all the cases. Yeah, I, I would. But what it would be the incentive for an intelligence community or for our government, which is always changing, by the way, to keep that a secret if it was non-military and if it was an actual for lack of a better term extraterrestrial uh or or you know object why why would they keep that a secret they'd be just as baffled as we are right so right right that'd be a hard thing to keep secret wouldn't it you would think so but they may i mean the the, the i think the it's a very complicated question but i think if you look back you know when these things when these sightings first started to be happening a lot it was during the cold war so in that situation they did not want the russians to know that we were baffled by these things that are flying around that we couldn't explain i mean it was very much about protecting ourselves in the in the cold war yeah. and as we developed and, and what i've been told is that we have been working on trying to understand how the technology works right both through collecting data and possibly through collecting materials or even downed objects and to the extent that we have learned how they work, we do not want our adversaries to know that that how they work, right? For obvious reasons. Whoever yeah. can develop this kind of technician technology, I'm sorry, yeah. is you know top of the world, right? right? So we're very concerned about protecting what we know. Um, we also, pro you know, so that's one point. And I think the other countries working on this are the same way. They're they're closely guarding it. There's concerns about panicking people. If you know, I mean if that was a big concern during the Cold War as well. I mean, the Cold War, the whole thing just went under wraps. And I think it just maintained that way. It maintained itself that way. And governments, the military tends to do that. It tends to like to keep things, you know, yeah. classified. It's sort of an obsession. And the implications are so vast, you know. So it's, um, I think, to just suddenly come out and acknowledge something like this is a hard thing to do. I think uh, the most powerful country in the world has not wanted over the decades to acknowledge that there's anything they can't control in their skies, right? If these things can come and go and as as it, when they want and they exhibit all this incredibly advanced technology, do we want to acknowledge that we can't protect people from that? That we don't know what these things are? I don't think any any Air Force, it's certainly not the American Air Force wants to admit that. I saw um, a video of a drone that can go from zero to like, 
300 miles an hour in one second. It was some crazy, like, ching, it literally just shot off into the distance. And that's what they let us see. And then uh, there's probably the, the nanotechnology that is allowing drones to be as small as a mosquito. So goodbye privacy, goodbye, you know, talk about eavesdropping. So, right, right. you know, I always tend to go with, don't underestimate how amazing human beings are when they put their mind to something and what they can, what they can create. Uh, it's kind of mind blowing. When I saw that, when I saw that drone do that, I thought to myself, if that's what they're letting me see, what do they have I can't see? And what's in development, right? So right, right. when you see this one thing that went, that if I think it was there and then it just dipped into the ocean and came back up and then shot somewhere else, we probably, I mean, it, I've seen drones behave in a crazy way right so it's it's possible it is it, it, it i always go to occam's razor but in, in that geo you guys talk about uh some of these move at thirteen thousand miles an hour can you explain that can i explain that no no i mean that's no but can you can you i'm sorry can you expand on that because that's crazy yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's what, again, I, I, that's what Luis Elizondo, who was the former head of this Pentagon program, which was what our story was about in December of 2017, that, you know, rocked the world and kind of opened yeah. up the door to all of this. He has reported that there are cases that can go that fast. And not only can they go that fast, but they can like turn at a right angle so they can stop. And then turn at a, a sharp right angle turn, whereas an aircraft has to make this big circular loop. To cover yeah. the same distance. I mean, things like that. You know, I, 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 I agree with you that it could be. I mean, it could be technology that we have, and it, it is very convenient to be able to cover it up by saying it's a UFO and let everybody think it's that. But I don't know. Can I mean, people like Luis Elizondo, people on the inside who have access to classified information and have the clearances, don't believe that that's what it is. And unless they're part of this major cover up to pretend that they're all UFOs, which I don't think they are, I'm, I'm gonna you know, respect what they have to say. And again, you've got to look back years ago when, when we observe the same kinds of things that we observe now. So it's the, a mystery, the, the, Brian, it's a mystery. Yeah, we haven't solved there are, it. There are two possibilities. One is that this is military technology. Two is that something else is, has been uh, observing this planet for quite some time with technology we just cannot explain. And and you're, are, you, I feel like you're leaning in that direction. And so are I a lot of people. Am, I'm leaning in that direction, I have to say. But, you know, I'm not saying I know for certain because I don't. I don't know yeah. for certain. But after, it's just from all the time and energy I've spent studying this and talking to people, I am leaning in that direction. Um, but... It's a mystery. I don't feel like we have the answer. How and did you get you into say, this? Yeah, you know, something else. That's something else. It's a big box. It yeah. could be, you know, there could be multiple explanations for this. There could be, it's just not simple, I don't think. And it yeah. may be that we will never know exactly. I mean, it may be that even if we come to the conclusion that these are, there, some of these are not human technology, we still may not be able to ever explain or at least clearly explain what they actually are. We might just know what they're not. So guys, uh, this episode and all the episodes are brought to you by Ketone IQ. What is Ketone IQ? It is basically a drink that will give you clarity, that will give you energy. Uh, why? It puts your body essentially in ketosis. So let me explain why um, I think this is... Uh, an amazing product. First of all, I take it and I feel the difference, but that's anecdotal. So don't take my word for it. This particular drink, Ketone IQ, was developed by DARPA, by a grant from DARPA, okay? Uh, let me keep going. They signed a contract with the US Special Forces, people that have to see measurable results, people that can't deal in bro science or pseudoscience. If they're going to sign a contract and get their soldiers to take this, it means it works. And guess who else uses it? People in the Tour de France, otherwise known as France. But I like saying France because I'm French. Again, I don't know if you know any Tour de France athletes. I don't, but I've read a couple books on the sport. And they are so crazy meticulous about everything they do. They will sleep outside on the ground because the electrons help their muscles 
uh, uh, recover faster. I mean, they, they do crazy stuff. So if they're taking ketone IQ, I'm taking ketone IQ. That's how I feel about it. I love when there's a product that is endorsed by people that, that have to see results because their jobs depend on it. Uh, sometimes maybe their lives depend on it if you're a, if you're a special forces operator. Ketone IQ, um, visit HVMN, okay? HVMN, that's H as in human, V as in Vicky, M as in movement, N as in nutrition. HVMN, uh, use promo code Brian, B-R-Y-A-N, because <laughs> my dad wanted to be different. He's like, you're going to be named Brian. So I spent my whole life going, no, it's Brian with a Y. Anyway, B-R-Y-A-N, and you will save 20% on checkout. This is important to me. When you do this, hit me up, DM me, email me. Let me know what you actually think of the product. I'm curious because I actually believe in it. I, I took it on air with, uh, with the owner of the company, and I was like, dude, I'm telling you, I feel this in my toes and in my hands, so I want to know what you feel like. But either way, it's brain fuel, clean energy. It's a boost without sugar or caffeine, and you can take the shot to re-energize. It's HVMN, which stands for Health Via Modern Nutrition. Okay? All right, there you go. And it's not a keto diet product. But either way, 60%, 60% of the Tour de France uses Ketone IQ. Wow, and none of them are keto. Damn! Now, let's get to the show. What is, uh, how did you get involved in this? How did you start um, investigating UFO sightings and well, I was working as a journalist at a public radio station back in 1999 in California in the Bay Area, and just I was I was a producer and an on-air host for a daily investigative news program, just covering a whole range of topics. And then a, a colleague in France sent me this 90-page study by French admirals and generals and space experts, and really, really top of the line, highly credible people in France. And it was all about UFOs. And they had spent three years looking at official data on UFO cases. And it was this whole report laying out the cases they studied and then providing an analysis and trying to explain how they could, you know, because of all the data they had, how these could, what these things could possibly be. And they came to the conclusion in that report that the best, the most rational and logical and valid explanation, and those are the exact words they used, was what they called the extraterrestrial hypothesis. In other words, they thought, and the, the cases they lay, they gave were very, very well documented. It was like they were able to rule out what they, they felt they could rule out any earthly explanation. Because if you don't have a lot of data, you can't rule rule it out, right? You don't know right. enough. Right. So, um, and these were, you know, involving military pilots and radar and all that kind of thing. So they, they said in black and white, you know, we think the, basically they were saying, we think we're being visited by something not from not earth. And I, I, I looked at this report and I was just blown away because I thought, you know, admirals and generals are saying this. It's like, when did what? this come out? When, when, when did they write this? It was in 1999. Wow. And yeah, and it was just in French, and and Lawrence Rockefeller, who was uh, one of the Rockefeller members of the family, who was very interested in this, had actually paid to have it translated into English, and I was the first person in America to be given a copy of it. And my colleague said, "Do you want to do something with this? You know, I'm giving it's it's like it's yours if you want this story." And I was like, "Well, yeah. I mean, I just couldn't believe what I was reading." And I, I'd been curious about UFOs prior to that, but I never, ever for a second imagined it would have anything to do with my professional life. You know, I just thought it was just something interesting to read books about occasionally. You know, it wasn't like I knew knew that much about it. So I just thought this is a really big story because I thought, what if the equivalent officials in America made that statement? Like, I it mean, would rock yeah, the world. Be, it was just right, France. Right. So, you know, it wasn't yeah. good enough. So I wrote my first story. I was a freelance uh, print journalist at the time, and I had re developed relationships with various editors and newspapers. In those days, you had hard copy newspapers. It was in 99, and you did freelance stories for them. And um, this this one editor in the Boston Globe really liked my work because I'd done a number of articles with her in the past, and she was willing to take the story, but it was really difficult. It was so taboo then, Brian. I mean, you could Still not- is. Yeah. You couldn't even use the word UFO without people laughing. Yeah, that's right. Um, and I remember when I pitched the story to her, I tried to avoid using that word. I mean, it was like, and she was really brave. I mean, most of the other editors I spoke to wouldn't touch it. And she was brave. And she at one point 
we spent months and months working on it. I mean, it doesn't, didn't never, no story ever took that long for me in those days. And at one point she just said, forget it. I can't do it. It's all done. We're not, we're not running this story. And I was so disappointed. And then I went back to her and she, she came back on board again. And I said, okay, we can change this or that. It was a really conservative story, but it, it was a story about what these authorities were saying. And it was a big deal. It was a long piece, you know. She gave it a lot did, of space. Did the, did the authorities, did those authorities in France ever contact you or, or respond to the, the article? Um, yes, and I actually met one of, the, one of the main writers of that report. I actually went over to France and met him, but that was afterwards, some years afterwards. Um, wow. Yeah, but, you and know, they were, they, were, they were pretty insular. I mean, it's, and it's not like that story got a lot of people talking, which is one of the things that surprised me. You know, I was naive at that point about how taboo this really was. I mean, or, or let's say I was aware of the taboo, but I, I thought this is such a big deal that, you know, certainly members of Congress are going to care or major investigative journalists like Seymour Hirsch or, you know, these, these major people that have worked for publications like the New Yorker, or the Washington Post could, you know, who can open all kinds of doors. I thought they would jump all over this. Because I was just a freelancer. I didn't have the kind of access that the, you know, the top investigative journalists had. But nobody batted an eyelid. It just didn't, you know, I mean, there, there was some notice of it. And the, you know, the people involved in UFOs were ecstatic that the mainstream media had taken this seriously like this. But there was nothing that happened, really. And I was surprised about that because I thought this was a really earth shattering thing. And that's what that was the moment, the turning point for me where I decided I got to do more of this. I don't understand why people are ignoring it. And that's what, what about, what about, started. how do you feel about Roswell? I mean, I don't know. I'm, I, I can't have it. I don't, I don't know what to say about it. I've read the books on it. It's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. I wish we had more solid information on it than we do. Yeah. Um, something. Have we ever been sure. allowed to go in? Has anybody ever been allowed to go into area 51 and take a look at, what goes on inside of the structures? I th yeah, people with very high levels of clearance can go in there, but the but no journalists, are, no journalists, not that I'm aware of. I mean, they may have a tour of the grounds or something. I don't know, but no, they're. I mean, you know, there are plenty of people that go inside, but they're not. They're not going to come out and tell you about it. I'll tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Or th or there'll be people that will claim, make certain claims. This has been a problem th for decades throughout the UFO world. All kinds of people come out with all kinds of claims, and there's no way to know whether they're telling the truth or not because they can't document or corroborate anything they're saying. And there are a lot of people that love to get involved with those kinds of stories, but you never know. And so I, one of my jobs as a reporter was to just stay away from all of that kind of ambiguous stuff. That's why I didn't spend a lot of time on Roswell, because I knew it's not something I would ever report on. And I wanted yeah, to that, that, that. Yeah. It it does have that thing for most of us, which is UFOs, Bigfoot, you know, uh, Loch Ness Monster. You know, it's it's that it 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 it's sort of you belong to this community if you start talking about it, right? It's it's that's what's that's kind of what's difficult to get over. But you know, and then it was always like every picture of a UFO is always blurry. You know, when are we gonna get a real picture of I a know. UFO? And and with so many people with cameras and and stuff you you wonder why we haven't gotten even the navy pictures that came out that was that was pretty blurry it was kind of right. a dot it looked like an old video game so so people like myself I, i'm always like look man when you guys get some measurable evidence where i can really see some stuff and see the windows or whatever call me you know but in the meantime i don't know i think a lot of us don't know what to do with the information like i don't know what to do with it like okay so maybe there are craft out there that has movement we can't explain um but is that new technology or is that some uh, you know extraterrestrial being and if it is now what you know exactly i mean i think you're right in the what you just described is the way so many people feel it's ex yeah. makes total sense because yeah i mean the videos we that they released were not that great but we know that they have better ones so i think what you say what can we do i think all we can do is keep putting pressure on our Department of Defense and our officials to release more. You know, we have. A why right do you think they're videos. keeping it? Why do you think they're keeping those videos to themselves? What what is what is the incentive for the Department of Defense or whoever's involved in this? Why they, would the press? 
Go yeah. ahead. Sorry. No, they they the way they explain it is that they don't. There, uh, some of the video has certain data built into it. You know, if you look at the videos, they have all this data along the edges, right? And there, or they have certain things in the video that they don't want our adversaries to know, such as the kinds of equipment we're using, the location we were at. Whatever they they're very they're very sensitive about not letting our adversaries see certain things and for instance even that famous gimbal video if you know the one I mean that shows the object and they the guys say it's rotating it's kind of yeah. going up along the cloud bank if yeah. you remember one of the pilots in there says there's a whole fleet of them look now we didn't get to see the fleet they cut the I didn't video hear off. I didn't hear that he said there's a yeah, whole he fleet goes, of them look there's a whole fleet of them. I can see wow. it on the something like I can see it on the ASA or something. Do you and, know? Do um, we know how far away those objects were from from his craft? His, his um, plane? I think that has been determined. I can't tell you off the top of my head, but I think there's I think there are analysts who have you know written up those videos, and you can look that up. There's a lot of details they do know. But the point I was making was that that part of the video was not included. It was not released. And, you know, so that we're just seeing sections of things and they they're they what they'll say is that there's certain information that would be a danger to national security if it was released and made public. And that's why they don't release more. But nonetheless, we all know that there is more that could be released that would not be a danger to national security. So there's this battle going on. There are people that and even and that includes members of Congress who yep. want very much for more information to come out. And that's why they've passed legislation and had a hearing and are putting pressure on the on the Department of Defense to bring out more. Yeah, I mean, I'm surprised because anybody in Congress would be just as curious as we are. It's like, if you guys have stuff, <clears throat> show us what's going on. But there at the same members. time, you know, we, we had uh, James Bamford on who wrote a book about the NSA. And the deep state is real. The deep state is, you know, there is, there is um, a culture of secrecy and and um, you're not going to get there's a lot of stuff that probably is kept from us for a variety of reasons. And sometimes just because it's the culture over there. Exactly. Uh, I completely agree with you. That's right. Yeah. Yep, yeah. Yeah. Right. Do you so, know so. do you know if we have a UFO division in in our Department of Defense? Is there is there is there any kind of a designated group of people that I don't know, have that mission? Yes, I mean there is there has been a task force set up within the Department of Defense and so our story broke in 2017 just saying that there had been one for the past 10 8 to 10 years there had been the secret task force right and since then it's morphed through various different names and structures but there's one and there's one right now that's been um put in place at the requirement of of legislation passed by Congress so there is an entity it's part of the Department of Defense it has staff and um, it is supposed to, uh, you know, take reports and it's, it's pulling together all the data that we that already exists from all these different government agencies. You know, the data has just been off in all these different places. Nobody even knows what anybody else has. Or So they've got to coordinate all of that. And they're also, as mandated by Congress, um, they've passed what, you know, people call it whistleblower legislation. But really, it's for witnesses. It's for those who have security clearances who have been prevented from talking about what they know or have seen because of their security oaths. These people are now given exemption from their security oaths and the door is open for them to go speak to this Department of Defense group and disclose what they know. And then also it will be disclosed to Congress. So there's there's really an effort underway between those two entities, the Congress and the Department of Defense to kind of get to the bottom of this and to get more information than they've ever had before. Um, which is which is historic. I mean, nothing like this has happened, you know, since the 1950s. You know, it, the story yeah, that this is happening. Sometimes I wonder if the machinations behind the magic trick would let us all down. You know, like like uh, th th there's this. We all love to think uh, that there's this super secret cabal of men, usually, you know, or just people in the bowels of Langley or somewhere that are actually controlling everything and keep the ultimate, ultimate secrets. Um, but, you know, I was thinking about the, the Afghanistan fiasco that uh, Biden oversaw when, you know, pulled out. Nobody really saw, nobody saw that coming unless you were somebody who was in Afghanistan or you were somebody who was studying that that nobody was listening to. But, you know, a lot of this stuff, 
I, I have friends that are um, high level, you know, operatives, you know, in, in the military, you know, guys who are like those elite soldiers. And then they went on to work for CIA and the paramilitary branches and stuff like that. And they do some pretty secret stuff. And they'll say some things sometimes where you go, wow. But what's always surprising to me is how actually unclamorous it is. <clears throat> they're always bursting my balloon. I'm always wanting to hear about this, that, and the other thing. And they're like, no, dude, it's not how it works. It's way harder than that. It, 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 so much is chalked up to stupidity. If we were that good, we wouldn't have been there for 22 years. And, you know, so a lot of times I'm always disappointed with, like James Bamford said, that the, our biggest secrets in the NSA were actually hacked by somebody in the agency and then sold on the dark web to Russia and to North Korea, and that gave rise to the wanna cry virus. So, you know, it's always like, it's like, what's going on? Is, is there, is there a, this secret cabal of super organized evil people who are keeping everything a secret? Or, or is it just the fact that it's a bloated bureaucracy and nobody wants to be a whistleblower because they don't know what's secret, what's not? They don't know what's military. They don't know what, you know, that, those are the questions I guess we don't know. I guess that's what you're in yeah. the business of doing. Yeah, I mean, I think you it's know. more the latter. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's some, you know, guys sitting in, in rooms smoking cigarettes, like 10 guys that know everything and can pull the strings on everything. I just think yeah. it's, it's kind of ingrained in, in how we go about this. And this is, I mean, there has been a, a profound stigma against having anything to do with this, which was, yeah. you, you know, you just can't imagine the impact that that had, you know, even, even when it was a danger to air safety, it was the stigma ruled. Uh, and the, the point is that if we discover that these are all either Chinese, Russian or American objects, that's a good thing to discover. We need to find that out. And mm -hmm. we haven't been doing our job if they seem to have been flying around and we haven't even seen them or let alone have any idea what they are. So, I mean, regardless of the outcome, I think there's the motivation is this is a national security issue and we need to get to the bottom of it. And that's what the people in charge keep saying. And I think they're right. Maybe we're going to find out they're all explainable. But, Maybe, you know, but it sounds it to me, it sounds to me like you're you're talking to people in 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 sort of the deepest bowels of defense who are willing to say at least we don't know or we have nothing to do with this, right? I mean, I mean, certainly the insiders or the people you know that have clearances and who I trust definitely the, the don't know what it is for sure. I think some of them would even go further than that and say they don't believe that this is man-made technology or that really you've talked you've talked to people in the government who actually believe that well these are former officials i would say retired people um who have been around the block with this i mean there's so much more to it there's so many so much strangeness and you know just so much more data than well, we know about but what do you I think mean, you you've been studying this what is your if you were to take all of your the romance out of it You've, you've talked to these people and you've talked about the fact that there are a lot of through lines between sightings from the 50s to 2023. Very similar descriptions, right? Uh -huh. is, is, is that what causes you to lean sort of toward the idea that this is something that's been around for a very long time? Is it, is it, is it the fact that the stories sound so similar? I think that's a big part of it, Brian. I think it's also just the nature of the phenomenon that's being described. It is hard to imagine in certain cases that we could create it, but I might be wrong about that. Um, you know, there sometimes that people get very close to these things. They have psychological effects. They have effects on their con level of consciousness. They have medical effects. Uh, there are things like orbs. I mean, UAP now. You know, it's not just a flying saucer. It, it encompasses also things like baseball size orbs, even expanding it further because it's not only aerial. It can be underwater. It can be in space. Right. So, you know, and this is the official terminology for this. It's any. And so some of the phenomena are really strange things like smaller orbs that might penetrate someone's body or fly around their home and cause medical effects on that person. Now, this has been documented in some powerful books, and it's been documented in documents, you know, documentation that was provided to the Defense Intelligence Agency in a project that took place beginning in 2007. Very, very strange things that, you know, and there's one case of this, this person who was driving a car when this, with his daughter, when this thing came through and 
And he, it's documented because of all the medical effects that occurred. The daughter saw the same thing. Um, it's hard to imagine that this is something that we would be creating and doing to human beings in our in our population you know we just don't know how to explain it can you um, talk about the yeah. mass sightings can you talk about the mass sightings that well, there's one in texas i think uh the what sightings the, the sort of mass sightings where a lot of people saw the same thing at the same time and exactly. then can you talk yeah, about yeah. that yeah, in our series on the which um, just premiered last night. I don't know if we're going to talk about that, but we yeah. did cover one mass sighting in the second episode, which is now on Hulu. Which and and there's another. What, what's the was, name of the episode? What's the name of the uh, uh, of the, the show? In Texas. Stephen. Uh, no, the I, show is called UFOs Investigating the Unknown. Right, and it's on and it's now, Geo. and on Geo Hulu. Is, and it's on Hulu now, streaming episodes one and two, which just aired last night. Yep. Right. And there are two more episodes that are going to air. I don't know when this show is actually going to go up, but. Uh, well, for for what it's worth, my friend uh, watched it, I believe, and and was uh, riveted. Riveted. Oh, great. Well, I'd like yeah. to know, Brian, if you see that, see the whole thing. I'd like to know how you feel about UFOs then after you. I'm seen going. That. I'm going to watch the whole thing, and then I'm, I'm going to have you back on. Oh, cool. Because I'm um, I'm fascinated with that. Yeah. Yeah. The, but I want to talk about the mass science because I think that's a really, really good point. Um, because the, the one we have covered in our series was in 2008, and we revisited that case in episode two, in which in Stephenville, Texas, and it's just it's it's ha it also happened in Phoenix, Arizona, in 1997. They're called the Phoenix Lights, a very famous case, and this is where these massive objects hang around for they're not just a one-time sighting where they fly over and they're gone they're usually hanging around for a while and hundreds if not thousands of people see the same thing and the one that oh. happened in in phoenix arizona in 1997 i mean these things were there were two or three of them gliding over the state of arizona for about an hour and a half and people were calling into their police departments and they were calling into these UFO agencies, these UFO civilian agencies, because in those days there was no government agency doing anything about this. So people would call these various civilian groups that were well known for taking reports and they were able to map the trajectory of the objects just based on the calls they were getting. And there were no uh, pictures of it? There were no, nobody well, took pictures? Well, it's hard to, I know that's a really hard thing to understand. Apparently there was one really close up video that was confiscated by somebody and we don't know who and that's that's sort of one of these mysterious stories but i have to ask i have to answer that question because this is a question people bring up all the time and i've talked to so many of these witnesses brian and what they say is when you step out of your house and you see a delta shaped yeah. object the size you're of not a getting a camera field, yeah drifting over your your property and you know that in about 10 seconds it's going to be gone you just stand there with your jaw dropped open right that's fair that's fair. And nowadays it's different. I think, you know, then they didn't have cell phones in their pockets. They could just pull out in two seconds, right? They just had to, they would have to go in and get a camera. You don't take your eyes off that thing. Yeah. And it doesn't hang yeah. around long enough that you can take the time. But right. I think nowadays, if we ever had a mass sighting like that, I mean, there is no way, first of all, that our government could ignore it, which is what they did before. Or if they're pressed, come up with some kind of bogus explanation. That, those were the two options. So I, I wish we, I wish our friends, whoever they are, would show up again, and we could, you know, people would be documenting these things like crazy. And given that we now have a government office that's investigating them, assumedly they would take responsibility for this. In the in those days, there was nobody official that would pay any attention. There were also waves of sightings in the 1980s in the Hudson Valley and just north of New York. Same thing. Uh, they were seen repeated. This was a wave. A mass sighting is a one-time event that might take an hour or two. There's also waves where things will return to one location over a period of a year or a year and a half or two years. And you call that, you know, we call that, a, there was a wave in the Hudson Valley. There was another one in Belgium in the, in the late 18, 1980s, early 1990s, where, you know, just so many people saw these things, including police officers and military people. And they, they just seem to keep coming back. Has anybody done a study on how close to those sightings a military base was? Do, do we, has anybody done, done that and said, you know, because if there was an Air Force base near there, I'd be like, well, you know, maybe that was some experimental aircraft, but, you know, who knows? Yeah, I mean, they were flying over a, a large area, but there's always yeah. Air Force base around. I mean, there certainly yeah. was one in Arizona. 
but they yeah, people sure. were calling them and they were saying we don't know we have no idea we have this is not i mean they were denying they had anything to do with it and they were saying we don't have any radar we don't know what this is in belgium which handled this very differently than we did they actually involved the air force they gave public press conferences about these events that were going on in belgium over a period of more than a year and they actually scrambled their f-16 jets or whatever jets were we used at the time to try to get a closer look at these objects and they reported all of this to the public now this is not the way america has handled these cases and it's notable the difference between it's one of the things i, I spent a lot of time studying when i was researching this is how differently it's handled in other countries than it is here and now, in some level, in some ways, we're sort of catching up because these other countries have been much more open about it than we have. Um, and yeah, so that's a fascinating element of it, too, for the same events to see how differently they're handled by the two different that, governments. That is for sure. That's for sure. It's, 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 um, it's a really weird thing because even if we knew, even if they came out and said, yes, we, the, yes, there's we can't claim ownership of these things and neither can any other country. Like now we just have to play a waiting game. Like what's going on here? Like, are we being studied? You know, right. I don't Who know. Knows? I mean, I think the thing about the other countries is they were always willing to say, we don't know what they are. Yeah. And we have, we have not been willing to say that until a couple of years ago. Yeah. I wonder right? why, what, well, why was it that the U S military, the Pentagon, um, kind of capitulated this this sort of the idea that at least there have been these sightings like why did they make it public uh do you know why was was there an explanation yeah, yeah. given for why why they changed right why they all of a sudden yeah. did acknowledge it it's i think it's yeah. because well because they were forced to basically because when the new york times story broke stating that there was a pentagon program that had been studying these things and they had all kind of data on it right the members of Congress then wanted to know, wait a minute, we didn't know about this. We want to be briefed on this. They got briefed. They uh, learned a lot more than we did because they got classified briefings. And then they went to the Department of Defense and said, you know, they, they talked to the pilots. They talked to a lot. They got briefed by officials who've been studying this for a long time within the government, within the Department of Defense, the intelligence community, the Navy. And the, the, the members of Congress were kind of up in arms and they wanted to know more. And so the Department of Defense really had to respond to that. Uh, and they, the, the, the Congress mandated that this task force that had been set up provide reports. And the first time that this was really, really acknowledged very strongly was in a report in June 2021 which was the office of the Depar division of Naval, the the ODNI, the office of the director of naval intelligence, I believe is what it stands for. But that, it was an intelligence community report provided to Congress, and there was a unclassified version provided to the public. And in that report, they basically said these are real physical objects. UFOs are real. They're they're a safety hazard. They need to be studied. We don't have data showing that their their technology belonging to you know private corporations or sneaky people in America developing them. We don't have data that they belong to Russia or that they belong to Chinese, but we don't know or that they belong to China. I'm sorry, but we don't know what they are, and they're real. And that was really stated very clearly in that report. And so there, you know, I I don't think if the events that had precipitated that had happened had preceded that, had preceded that, well, this, they would have done that. They didn't particularly want to, but they didn't have a choice at that point because Congress was involved and it was mandating that more transparency be provided and the investigations take place. And so that's that's still going on. The legislation has been escalating in terms of what Congress is now demanding. And, you know, they- it, You know what's funny? I, I just had a thought. I had a thought that it'd be, it'd be pretty interesting if- Maybe this is a psyop by the U.S. Department of Defense to spook the Russians, Chinese, and other uh, and everybody else into thinking we have technology that they could never come close to. So maybe these maybe these videos were made in you know in a studio. You know, you never know. Maybe this was all. Maybe this whole thing is just a way of getting. I don't know, but then you you have to explain all the all the witnesses and everybody who's always talking about these things. I'm still waiting for a video I can sink my teeth in. Oh, aren't we all, Brian? I mean, I that's that's one of the things people want so much, and the fact that we know they exist, 
you know, and if the Congress keeps at this, if they have another hearing, for instance, they had one already, which was pretty, pretty tame. But the, the, the vision is that maybe they'll have another hearing where they will actually call people in who really know something yeah. like some yeah. of the Navy policy. And maybe they could maybe in that situation, they will be able to sort of subpoena whatever that means on their level of, of you know, get something from the DOD, like a video that really is, is interesting. And maybe yeah. they'll there are members of Congress that seem to really want to do this. They, I'm they sure. Care. And so I think it's just a matter of moving in stages. And I think we are going to see more and more. And we're going to hear from these these people now who are going through this whistleblower kind of a process that we have set up, that the Congress has set up, and are starting to talk, go and have talks. They're already doing it. They're talking. Well, I, I have a friend. I have a friend who's on the Intelligence Committee. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll tell him to do so. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, That's but, you know... He's yeah. probably been briefed on this at very, maybe he'll go. Well, he, he was briefed on the balloons and I, and I said, well, tell me about that. And he said, oh, it's yeah. not sex. He goes, it's not as sexy as you think. He goes, it's, <laughs> he, he's like, kind of like rolling his eyes. And I was like, oh, okay. But, um, yeah. so, 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 so this is going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to label this, this podcast to be continued because I want to watch this series on, on Nacho slash Hulu. Uh, give me the name of the series one more time. Okay, so it's called UFOs Investigating the Unknown. And yeah, it was UFOs. Made by, yeah, made originally for CNN. Uh, and I, I was a consulting producer, and I'm also in it, you know, and I work closely with the film company that made it called Breakthrough Films. They're outstanding. CNN tanked after their, there was this merger, and they all went, they lost a lot of staff, and they just went through trauma, and their whole documentary film department collapsed. So this other media company, which is Disney Plus, Vice, Nat Geo, and Hulu, they're all connected. They they got a hold of this, and they're the ones that have it now. So that's why it, it is where it is. So it's going out on Nat Geo on Mondays and then going on Hulu until all for three weeks. And basically, it's on Hulu for everybody to watch streaming. Eventually, it'll go on Disney Plus, too. But the problem with Hulu is it can't be seen by people outside of America. But when it goes on Disney Plus, it will be. So yeah, for for anybody, and then if if you want to watch it, that'd be great, fantastic, Brian. Oh, and I'm gonna watch it. I, yeah, I'm I'm gonna watch it because this is the kind of thing that people just can't get enough of, and uh, you know, th there's something just so romantic about the mystery. And it's the uh, mystery, isn't that the thing? Yeah. I mean, all the points you make are really great about you know about maybe there is an explanation, but yeah. it's it's still a mystery. Brian. This is his intro song. Brian.